Gift Biz Unwrapped, Episode 20. When you teach a person a skill, it changes their life. Hi, this is John Lee Dumas of Entrepreneur on Fire, and you're listening to Gift Biz Unwrapped, and now it's time to light it up. Welcome to Gift Biz Unwrapped, your source for industry-specific insights and advice to develop and grow your business. And now, here's your host, Sue Monheit. Hi there, I'm Sue, and welcome to the Gift Biz Unwrapped podcast. Whether you own a brick-and-mortar store, sell online, or are just getting started, you'll discover new insight to gain traction and to grow your business. After you listen to the show, if you like what you're hearing, make sure to jump over and subscribe to the show on iTunes. That way you'll automatically get the newest episodes when they go live. And thank you to those who have already left a rating and review. By subscribing, rating, and reviewing, you help to increase the visibility of Gift Biz Unwrapped. It's a great way to pay it forward to help others with their entrepreneurial journey as well. Today, I am thrilled to have with us Jenny Doan. Jenny Doan and her husband, Ron, live in a small Missouri town and absolutely love the rural life. She has seven children and 21 grandchildren. She also has an infectious smile and a knack for breaking down even the most challenging quilt projects into quick and easy steps. Jenny started her business, the Missouri Star Quilt Company, in 2008, and then she began producing weekly tutorials on YouTube. Since then, she's been featured in numerous articles and is the subject of a wildly popular quilting magazine called Block. With more than 300 YouTube tutorials that have been viewed by, get this, over 50 million times, it's no wonder that Jenny Doan has been called the most famous quilter in the world. And we have her with us right now. Welcome, Jenny. Good morning. Do you have anything you'd like to add to your bio? No, that just makes me sound pretty amazing. <laughs> well, I think you are pretty amazing. <laughs> I'm like, wow, I'm all that. <laughs> you are all that, and you're going to share everything with us in about a second here. <laughs> all righty, let's get to it. All right. As our listeners know, we like to revolve the conversation around the life of a motivational candle. The light shines on you while you share your stories and experiences. So, Jenny, are you ready to light it up? Of course. Let's light it up. All right. Well, let's look at your motivational candle just to get a feel for you. What color is your candle? It's blue. What shade of blue? Uh, it would be probably a medium blue. And why do you like blue? It's just comforting. It's cool. I love the ocean. I love uh, serene colors. I guess it represents a bit of serenity to me. I got to tell you, I was very curious about what your answer was going to be because being surrounded by all those fabric colors, it's like, what's she going to pick? <laughs> yeah. And it's interesting because different colors appeal to me at different times. But as far as the color I always go back to, it would be blue. So that's your core color then for sure. That would be it. Yeah. And what is the quote that would be on this candle? When I was a young girl, I saw this quote and I used to, I mean, I, I was, I've always been a big journal keeper and I've, I've written things down for years. And this was a quote I wrote as a very young girl and I've tried to live my whole life by it. And it says, do a thing as best as you can and rejoice with him who can do it better. Because I kind of believe you're just always on a journey. However you do this today, you know, maybe tomorrow you'll do a little better, but today you do the best you can. And there's always going to be somebody who's better than you. So be happy for them. Absolutely. And I'm not sure there's that much of that in the world right now. Everyone wants to kind of hang on to their secrets. And there is a bit of competitiveness out there. Oh, for sure. But, you know, I keep hearing all the time that you give out your best stuff. You know, a lot of in the marketing world, they say, you know, you give out your best stuff for free. You doing all of your tutorials and all that. And I think when you do that, it does come back to you. It does. My mom always said, if you cast your bread upon the water, it comes back buttered. Oh, there you go. I just feel that way. I feel like the more you give, the more you get. Absolutely. I'm on that path with you for sure. <laughs> There's another quote. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Maybe you'll have to have two. I'm not sure. There we go. <laughs> well, let's go back now to the beginning of your journey. Talk to us about how the whole Missouri Star Quilt Company started. Where did that spark come and how did it all happen? Well, I think it basically came because my children all grew up and left home. Honestly, the first 50 years of my life raising children, that just felt crucial and important. I loved every day of it. I mean, I just really enjoyed that part of my life. And it felt really important to me. And all of a sudden, I was home alone. 
And I thought, what am I going to do with the rest of my life? And I'm not sure I was really content to just fill time. I wanted it to matter. I had as many years ahead of me as I had behind me. I just thought that that should be something important. And while we were looking for something important, one of my kids asked if I would be interested in learning how to quilt on a quilt machine because I had been quilting for about 20 years and I've sewn my whole life. But um, when we moved to the Midwest, I mean, quilting is what you do here. So I took a class. That was really fascinating to me and just grabbed my creativity gene. So the children asked me if I would be interested in doing that. And I'm not sure what their motivation was, whether it was just to keep me from living in their basement, because now I'd have retirement money. You know, I'm not sure. (laughs) But I think they were also, you know, they were a little concerned about what I was going to do for the rest of my life. And my first thought honestly was, Well, that is a hobby, a bit of a hobby, and I'm not sure I just want to fill time with that. What I didn't know at the time was that when you teach a person a skill, it changes their life. And so that is something that I've learned along the way. That quilt machine came, and I mean, that was just, it just changed everything for me, absolutely everything. Well, let me back you up for a second and clarify. You were saying that as the kids were growing up, you were already quilting. Yes. Right. So so you had a machine and you were just giving it out? No, no, no. No. So, uh, okay. So that's a completely different part of it. When we lived in California, I was a costumer and uh, had costumed and did theater productions. And so I also sing. So I did musical comedy. Well, when we moved to the Midwest 20 years ago, nobody needed a costumer in this little town. And when you love something, when you're passionate about doing something, creating something, you can't just stop doing it. So my creating was sewing and I sewed all the time. And all of a sudden I needed something to sew. So I took this class on quilting. Now, when I talk about quilting, I'm talking about piecing pieces of fabric together. I'm a piecer. And so I would make the tops of the quilts and I would send them off to be quilted. And one day I said to Alan, um, hey, I'm going to go get a quilt today. And he said, oh, what one is it? And I said, I don't know. It's been over a year that it's been there. And he goes, is this a thing? Do people like, do we need more long arm quilters? You know, is this something, you know, you should look into? And I said, you know what? I said, there's never enough long arm quilters because piecers the people who sew the tops together, we are like obsessed. We have to keep doing it. So that's when I started looking into the quilt machine for me to seeing if that was something viable I could do to make money. So then the quilt machine actually takes the top of the quilt and the bottom of the quilt and puts a cotton batting in the middle. And the the machine actually stitches all three of those layers together. And so that was the quilt machine that came I was already piecing quilts. I wasn't actually doing the on-top quilting. Until I got a quilt machine, I had generally quilted by hand. Oh, my gosh. That's time intensive. I know that for sure. It is time intensive, but it's very rewarding as well. Yeah. I mean, there are two different results, the quilter versus doing it by hand, for sure. Right, right. Okay, so you get this quilt machine, but was this before or after your daughter had suggested maybe you want to go into business? No, it was way before. So the machine came and it was too big for our house. So then we had to buy a building to put it in. So the building actually cost less than the quilt machine did. But (laughs) but now that we had a quilt machine in a building, we had a business. And the reason I like the idea of the building is because a lot of long armors and long arm is the name of, of what they call people who quilt on a big quilt machine. They're called long arm machines. And, um, and it's not because anybody has long arms, but it's just because they're, you know, they're long on the table. There's a big throat in the machine and you have to have a reach to be able to move that machine back and forth. So I guess you do need a little bit of long arms. So the machine came too big for my house. We had to buy a building. And once we had a building, then we had a business. And the reason I liked that was because when I would take my quilt to somebody's house, if they smoked, that was a problem for me. If they had pets, that was a problem for me. But now for us to have a business, people would be safe from that. You know, it would be a more conducive environment because fabric soaks up everything, you know, it soaks up all kinds of smells and, you know, things like that. And here's your quilt. And if you're not a smoker, then that's something that creates a little bit of problem for those of us who aren't or are either way. For me, to having it in a building, you know, it offered an environment that people wouldn't be worried about pets or personal habits or things like that. And so I was really excited about having it a building. So we put it in a building and we put a little sign on the window that said machine quilting. We decided that we were going to have a business and people would bring their quilts to this little building and, you know, trying to support us. You know, I had probably 20 quilts made that I practiced on until I felt comfortable enough 
quilting on someone else's quilt. And so we just started with the business with that. And that was just going along fine. And we thought we'd do a little quilt shop. Maybe we'd get a little fabric. And all of that was such a learning experience for us because we knew nothing. And Sarah and Natalie would come down and and we'd work on it together. And they each had little kids and corralled them in a back room (laughs) so that we could keep doing this. So the whole beginning of it was very organic. When my son, Alan, came in and said, Mom, are you interested in doing tutorials online? When we made the jump to that, that's when things really exploded. Because now we're not just dealing with whoever knocks on our door. It's whoever happens to click on that channel. That moved us into a whole different place for our business. And what does your business look like today? Just give our listeners a feel for that. Let me just tell you that every day I wake up feeling amazed and blessed. This business is huge. It is. We have um, pretty close to 200 employees. We ship loads of stuff every day. We have a warehouse. Whoever thought we would have a warehouse? We have uh, six stores open in the little town that we live in, and all those stores are fabric specific. So we would have a batik shop and a solid fabric shop and a Christmas fabric shop. We bought the old abandoned buildings downtown, so it's revitalized our downtown area. People are bustling through the town. I mean, it's just amazing, absolutely amazing, mind-boggling, the things that are happening. You know, it's just, it's huge. It's, it's a big business now. You know, the thing that jumps out at me is you took, and, and I don't know that you even identified it, you know, one of your children did, is you took this passion that you had, kind of just a hobby, sewing, and one thing evolved into another, and clearly you really enjoyed it because you did it for years, and then they were the ones who pointed out to you that, you know, why don't you look at doing this? Why don't you look at quilting? Absolutely. Yeah, I wouldn't have seen that. I wouldn't have made that jump. Really interesting. So Gift Biz listeners, think if you're in a position where you're looking at what could you do or what do you want to do next, you're in that life stage where your kids are gone, you want to do something new, what have you already been doing all of your life? And you might think that it's not anything that could develop into something, but look at what Jenny did. It was one step after another. You bought the quilted machine and then you had a little place for it. And then one thing led to another. And then you took advantage of the technology that's available today with YouTube. But all of it goes back to what you personally are so passionate about, number one, and number two, clearly have the talent and do so well. Well, and that's the thing. If you love what you're doing, you're going to love it. You know, you never want what you do every day to feel like work. You know, you want it to be something that you enjoy, that you want to sink your time into. Like for some people, like for me, for instance, my love is the creating and the piecing. That's my love. I have no love for the business end of things, you know, or, you know, or the construction end of things. But if I can create something that is going to make life easier for somebody or make a pattern come to life or something like that, for me, that's the love. And it took me a while to actually hone in on that and really find that. That wasn't something I wasn't used to that kind of introspective thinking. And I actually noticed that when that kind of part was removed from what I did on a daily basis. And I found I just wasn't as happy as I had been. And I thought, what is missing? And I'm like, it's the creative part. And so, you know, it takes a little bit of introspection on your part. But also the whole thing came about because there was a need. You know, my son said, well, why has this quilt been at the quilters for a year And it's because there's a lot of work for them available. So obviously, there's a need for more people to do that sort of thing. Two good points you just brought up, the introspection and then the need. What's around in your immediate environment that people need? And who would have thought sewing? (laughs) Who would have thought? (laughs) Who would have thought sewing would do this, you know? (laughs) Really? But it's amazing to me. It's a really happy story. It's a great story of growth. I know you've done a lot for the town in terms of being able to employ people and bringing a lot of people into the town because they're now visiting. But you know that the road isn't always nice and smooth. I'm sure as you were going through one path to another, you did encounter some problems. Tell us a moment or a time when you really had a challenge and how you overcame that. For us, the first big challenge was when we could not, the three of us, Natalie, Sarah, and I, we could not physically do it all ourselves anymore. For us, that was the hugest hurdle because now we had to hire somebody, but we weren't even paying ourselves yet. And so now you have somebody you have to hire that you have to really pay. You know, they're not going to just do it for free. And it's your reputation. Now you're letting someone else kind of have control over that area. So it was so bizarre, but we like checked over everything we thought 
we could have somebody else do without affecting our business or our reputation. So the first hire we made, we hired a high school girl to come in and clean for us. (laughs) I know that sounds crazy, but that freed us up to keep focusing on the business part and the creative part. And that stuff was all done. So you wouldn't let her touch any sewing or anything, but she could clean. No, it didn't affect our business directly, except that it freed us up. For us, actually, the employee thing has always been one of the most difficult things. But the minute you make that leap and you hire somebody to take care of those things in your life that are time consuming and necessary, but it's not what feeds you or builds your business, it enables all that creative energy to then be just, you know, you don't even have to think about what your baseboards look like because you can just go so you know, you can just do this because you know they're done. And so for us, that was the first big challenge, hiring someone. And the next hires, we would look seriously at what can we release from us so that we can keep doing what we love. The only way you're going to be able to expand and grow is if you do end up bringing people in. It's so true. I remember the first time I had to hire someone, it was like, I, because I had this idea, you know, I am superwoman and I can do everything myself. I did too. At some point, you're going to max yourself out. There's only so big you're company can grow if you're just going to keep it within just the confines of yourself or you and one other person or a family, as was your case, Jenny. It's absolutely true. And now we're to the point that the people we have to hire are people who are smarter than we are. So we've gotten it as far as we can go. And then you have to hire somebody who really, you know, like for instance, we have an, we just, we hired an HR person and this can't be a person who's just nice to people. It has to be somebody who knows the law, somebody who knows, but all of a sudden we're like, We need that, you know, and it's like, we really need that. So it's interesting to me how those hires are going now, because, you know, as a person, you have to recognize your limitations as well. And again, you want to keep yourself free to do what you do best, because that's what the business is based on. Good point. Would you say that after your first hire, though, these the second, third, fourth started coming easier? I would say so. It was that first leap that was just so... (laughs) frightening, you know? Yeah, it's that mental hurdle because this is your baby. You're going to let someone else have their hands on it? And (laughs) not only that, but you have to pay them. If you don't have money and you want to keep your lights on in your business and you just want to sit and sew whatever, you can do that. But all of a sudden you have this person you're responsible for. That was huge for us because when you're in a retail business, you don't know if one person or 20 people are going to walk through the door that day. From your experience, is there any guidance you would give about when you feel the right time is to make that first hire? Well, for us, it was the overwhelm factor. We were just so overwhelmed. Everything else in our life was getting neglected. You know, our families were neglected. Our homes were neglected. And we just, I think you have to do that. It's like you have to do everything you know you possibly can before you go, okay, you know what? I need some help. I think as your frustration level builds... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, and you find your family going, uh, mom, can I make an appointment uh, for with you for, you know, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's not a good. Yeah, sign. that's not a good <laughs> sign. And it could lead to you just burning out and shutting down the whole business too. really good conversation about hiring. I appreciate that. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit now about a promotion or an event that you might have done that made a difference. Either, you know, you've talked about starting in with YouTube and maybe that's where you want to go with this. But I'll let you decide what really started moving the needle in terms of people coming in and knowing your business. Well, that would have to be our YouTube channel. One of the things that has always surprised me is how many people are visual out there. I'm a visual learner. I'm also an avid reader. I mean, I consider myself a pretty well-rounded learner. It wasn't nothing was like super difficult for me as far as this type of learning or that. But I've taught a lot of my children and they're all different types of learners. But what surprised me was that I have known all my life, if I could just see you do something, if you could just show me, then I can replicate that. I can do it in a heartbeat. But if I read the directions, I'll read them and reread them several times before they really sink in or I'll have somebody else read it and say, okay, just tell me what to do. And so I was so surprised when we started doing the tutorials, there were women that just, it was crazy how many people were like, oh my gosh, thank you so much. Because if I can just see it, I can do it. And so for us, that was huge. Also, the internet, I mean, you can put an ad in every paper in your local area, but the internet is everywhere. In my mind, and I think it's probably my generation across the board, we don't think in the terms of this huge you know, that the world is our audience. We're thinking, let's put an ad in the newspaper. That was all Alan's deal. Alan's over everything that happens online with our business. My son, Alan, he's very aware of what's happening out there and how it's working and the direction it's going. For us, it was that internet thing that 
you know, getting us out there, getting us online, making us see. Now, the thing that surprised all of us is that once we got our site together and opened our online business for business, you think everybody's going to know about that. And that really, I think, is a word of mouth thing. That happens a little more slowly than we thought as far as, I mean, you you launch your site and you think everybody's going to be knocking on the door. And I think by the third day, we had eight people. But if what you're doing is good, when eight people see that, they're going to tell eight more people. It very quickly gets bigger from that point. Jenny, how long after that first YouTube video did you start seeing some traction? Well, the videos originally were just to teach people how to quilt. We were not selling fabric. We were doing machine quilting for people. And I just wanted to share my knowledge with people, you know, how it worked for me, how it was easier for me. We were doing a lot of classes and things like that. And I thought if we can do, because here's the problem with taking a class. When you take a class with somebody, when you walk out the door, you forget like three quarters of everything you learned in there. Doors like suck the knowledge out of us or something. I don't know what it is. <laughs> but the fact that they could go online and they could rewind it and pause it and watch it again and watch it again and watch it again was huge for these people. I'll never forget the day when a lady called and she goes, well, I would like to buy some of that green fabric you're using. And I said, oh, no, no, I'm not selling fabric. I am just showing you how to sew. And she goes, well, I want that green fabric. And I said, well, this is my own personal fabric. This is a stash, my stash. It's not for sale. And she goes, well, then where did you get it? And I was like, gosh, where did I get that piece? You know, 20 years ago, you know, I mean, it's like, when did we get that? I don't know. You know, nobody knows. We've had it forever and we're just using it. And so I can remember going to Alan and saying, Alan, we should think about buying fabric. But that was also another huge floodgate of stuff because there's so much stuff out there, then what do you buy? Do you buy the stuff I like? Do you buy the stuff Sarah likes? I mean, what do we buy? We didn't want to go into debt. We didn't want to invest any money. And that was the same time that one of the fabric companies came out with what we call pre-cuts, which is an entire line of fabric in one pack. So then we could buy these packs of fabric or a bolt of fabric to go with them so they could do their borders and finish their quilt. And so then we started doing that and teaching you that. That was when the selling part started happening. And we thought, oh, this is nice, you know, and people are buying things. And, you know, still at the time, we didn't realize it was going to be this huge thing where we'd have to really employ people. You know, we were just, oh, this is nice. We'll sell a little fabric, you know. Yeah, little did you know. Yeah, we just didn't. <laughs> the big point here is you were listening to your customer and then really hearing what they were saying that is true. in terms of the fabric. And then that led into a whole nother big avenue for you for the business. Absolutely. So, what do you do with your customers once they place an order or on the customer service end so that they keep coming back? My generation kind of was the big retail generation and they had the motto, the customer is always right. We really believe that. The other thing that we do is we know that it's way easier for you to go to a brick and mortar store close to you and purchase something. So we have to make your experience at least as good, if not better than that experience. One of the things we do is every order is personally signed. And I can remember when we had to start hiring people to help us ship, there was a boy who was there and he's like, well, I have messy handwriting. I'll have somebody else sign it. And I said, no, 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 no. You packed this. You're going to sign this. They don't care if you have messy handwriting. They care that you took the time to thank them. And so somebody signs every individual order, whoever packs that order, thanks you and signs that order. And I think people love that. I think they like that. That's very personal. Yeah. And then different people possibly with different orders. So they start seeing, kind of seeing who's there. Oh, absolutely. It also gives you a lot of credibility as a business, as if you need any more after all the YouTube videos and your press. But in terms of that, there are a lot of employees there too. It's very important to us. We want you to have the same experience you have online. We want you to have when you come, we want you to have that Disneyland experience. We want you to have a good experience on the phone. So we do whatever we can to make it right. Well, let's move now, Jenny, into our reflection section. What is one trait that you have that you think has helped you to be successful? The fact that I'm cheerful and that I'm nice. <laughs> That sounds so small, but it is huge. I mean, this is not always a really happy, pleasant world we live in. And the fact that I have a cheerful personality um, and I joke, I, I admit it when I make a mistake, I tease with people. And I think that they just really enjoy that. They really enjoy that. Uh, they Sometimes I think in our daily lives, we forget how good it feels to laugh. And I handle everything with humor. So it really helps people to relax. Nothing I do is stressful. Like if I'm teaching a class or something like that, my whole goal is that you enjoy this process. If you're not enjoying it, we're doing something wrong. Right. 
I think that's definitely a trait that's led to your success. I had another guest that we interviewed and her comment was people are attracted to happy. Oh, I agree. I agree. And you, especially with YouTube, I mean, you're out there and you're showing your presence and all of that to the world and to be cheerful and happy. And it comes across so much in the YouTube videos. I watched a couple of them before we spoke. Oh, thank you. And people know that they can expect it to be uplifting and interesting and easy and very educational, you know, when you're putting all the pieces together and teaching people how to do things. So it's not just that you're teaching them, it's also a fun experience, just like you were saying earlier when we were talking about customer service. Absolutely. What tool do you use regularly that either keeps you and your staff productive or allows you to keep balance in your life? Probably that is the hardest thing I have to do. I have a hard time balancing things. I tend to get into everything 100 million, 10 percent, you know, uh, <laughs> and I put everything into that. And then other things kind of fall by the wayside. And I've actually been working a lot on balance because I don't. For instance, I'll spend 10 hours at work, but I have a hard time giving myself an hour to take a walk or to exercise or things like that. It's not a priority in my life and my health suffers because of that. So I, I'm not sure I would know the tool, you know, that, that uh, helps you create balance. For me, it's generally somebody, you know, it's like how the whole business went from one part to the next where you realize that you're so overwhelmed and overworked that you have to do something. And that's kind of the tool I'm using now is desperation, I guess. <laughs> desperation that leads to change. But I don't recommend it. It's not a nice tool. <laughs> So I'm working on that. Well, you know, I think it's hard because you clearly love your business as well. So it, you're not necessarily saying, okay, now I'm going to work. It's that now I'm spending my time with something that I like and you're not thinking necessarily work. Right. I've just started walking at lunchtime because I also, I got a Fitbit for Christmas and I saw how little I was walking because I'm always at the desk or at the computer. And boy, that's got me out and going because I saw how little I was moving around. I have a Fitbit. I'll just have to see if I can find it somewhere. Well, there you go. <laughs> there you go. I might have to start calling you. Are you out there yet? There you go. There you go. Are you walking? 10,000 10, steps a day. Well, and that's one of those things that I keep waiting for somebody to say, hey, Jenny, let's go take a walk, you know, and it really comes down to, do I want to do that? And uh, I keep waiting for somebody to kind of take over that part of my life and it's not happening. So I really do need to take charge of that. <laughs> okay. So here's what you do. You get your Fitbit on and then you have your phone available and then you listen to this podcast while you go walking. There you go. There you go. Perfect. There you go. <laughs> Is there a book that you've read lately or some resource that you would think our listeners would find value in? So let me just tell you how I'm a voracious reader and I read, I mean, I have several things going all the time and I read like crazy, but I read for a purpose. And the purpose is, is that my brain never stops churning. It churns out ideas. I fix things in my brain. I mean, it's going all the time. New ideas in, new ideas out, how to do this, how to do that. I can't shut it off. So the books I read have to be stimulating enough so that I'm thinking about somebody else's problems instead of mine. And so then I can think about their stuff and it actually allows me to sleep and not think all night long, you know, not wake up tired in the morning. So for me, reading is a tool to enable me to turn my, shut my brain off from all the things, you know, all those creative wheels. And I think a lot of us in the creative circles have that problem. We have a really hard time shutting our brain off and actually resting. Books help me do that. So at night, I'll read something that is generally very intense. You know, I like John Grisham. I like James Patterson. I like th those kind of mystery things like that. That. Um, so what are you reading right now? I am actually reading a book about a, um, a woman who was <laughs> kidnapped down in, uh, she was raised by rebels in the Colombian forest from the time she was 12. And now somebody wants to kidnap her child. And I can't remember the name of it or the author. It's just something to keep my brain busy. So I'm thinking about something else. Right. Well, there's a lot of drama in that book. That's for sure. There's a lot of drama in that book. <laughs> will, you, will you email me the name and the author of that book? Sure, sure. <laughs> okay, wonderful. <laughs> So Gift Biz listeners, I talked with Jenny after the show, and the book she was referencing here is called No One to Trust by Iris Johansson. Just as you're listening to this podcast today, you can also listen to other audiobooks with ease. I've teamed up with Audible for you to be able to get an audiobook just like the one that Jenny has recommended for free. All you need to do is go to giftbizbook.com and make a selection. That's awesome. Time is starting to run down, but we do have one final question here, Jenny. I'd like to present you with a virtual gift. 
It's a magical box containing unlimited possibilities for your future. This is your dream or goal of almost unreachable heights that you would wish to obtain. Please accept this gift and open it in our presence. What is inside? Better balance and better health would be inside. Better balance and better health. Just taking care of myself more. Perfect. And that's something you have total control over, right? It really is. <laughs> I don't know a matter what, of getting to it. the control yet, but, but I, I know it's my job. <laughs> it's got to jump to the top of the priority list, that's right? right? That's right. <laughs> How can our listeners get in touch with you? We have MissouriQuiltCompany.com. We have Facebook pages. I have a personal page called Jenny Doan Quilts. Obviously, you can watch uh, tutorials on YouTube and comment there. Uh, there's just all kinds of ways to get a hold of us. If you put start typing in Missouri Star Quilt Company, you'll have a whole list of things to get in touch with us. Fabulous. And Gift Biz listeners, you can also jump over to giftbizunwrapped.com where you'll find the show notes page. And there I'll have a list of all of the different places that you can get in touch with Jenny or her business. That's awesome. Thank you so much for the valuable gift that you've shared with us today. Your journey, your insights, one fabulous story, that's for sure. I really appreciate your taking the time, Jenny, and may your candle always burn bright. Thank you so much. I appreciate you having me. Learn how to work smarter while developing and growing your business. Download our guide called 25 Free Tools to Enhance Your Business and Life. It's our gift to you and available at giftbizunwrap.com slash tools. Thanks for listening and be sure to join us for the next episode. Today's show is sponsored by the Ribbon Print Company. Looking for a new income source for your gift business? Customization is more popular now than ever. Brand your products with your logo or print a happy birthday Jessica ribbon to add to a gift right at checkout. It's all done right in your shop or craft studio in seconds. Check out the ribbonprintcompany.com for more information. Would you like to be on the show? Or do you know someone who can provide valuable insight from their experiences? If so, we'd love to hear from you. All you need to do is submit a form for consideration. You can access the form at giftbizunwrapped.com forward slash guest. That's giftbizunwrapped.com forward slash G-U-E-S-T. 